So good morning and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. Today, I am joined by Murray Phillips, um, who is a colleague of mine, and we do a lot of work together. Murray is a chartered accountant. He's a business advisory specialist, and he has a business called Insight CA, but he's also just about to launch, in fact, probably will have launched by the time this comes online, a new business called Cash Out Catalyst. And Cash Out Catalyst, from what I understand, is all about working out um, how you get the most money out of your business when you're ready to sell it. Is that right? Yes, correctly. Yeah, yep. brilliant. So welcome, Murray. Good to thank have you, you here. Thank you very much. Yeah. That, well, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Oh, absolutely. Looking forward to having a chat to you. So we're going to talk today about exit strategy and planning and what that looks like. But before we do that, I would love to just hear a little bit about Murray as the person. So if you could share with me a professional and a personal best from your life, that would be really helpful. I think as a chartered accountant, it's all about helping those around you. Um, we go into business. And we know a specialty or a trade, but we don't know everything about running a business. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to educate the um, client or potential client to understand that there are professionals out there that are out there to drive your business forward. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where uh, Insight CA comes in as a business advisor. Yeah. And following on from that, that's where Cash Out Catalyst will come in and helping you to exit your business. Yeah. So that's what you love to do from a professional basis. What about personally? What do you love to do outside of work? What's been your personal best well, in your life so far? Well, well pre-COVID, it was, um, I used to enjoy swimming and going for, for oh, yeah. walks. Um, swimming is off the agenda at the moment. Yes. Um, but then I've got three grandchildren who I like to spend time with. Ah, excellent. Okay. Where are they here in Auckland? One's or? in Auckland and two in um, Rotorua. Ah. Ah, brilliant. Okay, cool. So we are going to talk a little bit about um, exit strategy and plan. But before we do that, I'd love to hear your story. So about how did you get into accounting? Why did you get into accounting? Because to me, that feels like a job I could never do. And then obviously, it's morphed into kind of business um, consulting as well. So tell me a little bit about your, your history and your story. So um, I'm one of five boys in my family. Uh, yeah. We owned a farm. My uh, father was blind. And so we had to exit that. Um, well, we left it and we went to live in town yeah. uh, and then on to boarding school. But in my holidays, I used to go and work for the chartered accountant and I got a feel for it because initially I was going to leave school and I was going to be a school teacher. Ah, okay. And I decided, no, there's too much stress with that. So yep. I had to find another avenue. I then said, I'd like to be a chef. <laughs> and then I said, no, all chefs are fat. <laughs> Um, that's I'm, I'm there already so uh, <laughs> let's go into a profession and uh, accounting was that okay and um, you've obviously been working with a lot of clients over your time um, what's the biggest challenge that you see with most businesses that you work with is there a common theme yeah um, they all go into business um, and they typically go in and the, fundamentally when you understand it they've brought themselves a job yeah right and they've Unless they actually surround themselves, get the expert advice to help them grow their business, they won't have a business to sell when they exit. Yeah. So one of my slogans in the Cash Out Catalyst is don't let your lifetime work retire with you. Ah, love it. Yeah, that makes so much sense. And it is really interesting that I know I certainly have experienced it is that people don't start thinking about preparing the business for sale until they're actually ready to sell it. And that's generally three to five years too late because you need to put the work in beforehand yeah. Um, yeah. to get the best possible value out of it. So one true? of my sermons that I preach is the day you start your business is the day you start to plan your exit. <laughs> okay. Right? Because at the end of the day, when you're going to exit, you don't know, are you selling it to your family, yep. which has one sale price? Mm -hmm. Are you going to sell it to your management, which is the now selling price, or are you going on the open market? Yeah. Each of those have a different philosophy, but you've got to, you've got to be in there to start with. Systemize the business. The business can't be about you. Yeah. It's got to be about a brand or a product or a service, but not you. Because mm. when you go to retire, you typically just close the door. Yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. And uh, I suppose, you know, because I often think uh, we, may, we may not go into business thinking about the fact that we're wanting to sell it, but it isn't just about selling it. It's about actually how do you get yourself out of it when you're ready to get out of it? Well, the thing is, so often um, you could have the unforeseen circumstance where you have a heart attack, you have a stroke, whatever, mm -hmm. you have a major car accident. How do you get out? Yeah. Right? You haven't planned. Right? So not only would insurance help, but if you had a strategy in place to start with that was documented um, and was you know, reviewed by your chartered accountant and your 
legal team, mm -hmm. then the, the way forward is fundamental. Hmm. Okay. So what do people think to think about when they're thinking about an exit strategy as such? I, I, and part of the theme of Cash Out Catalyst is all about, um, it's a, Cash Out Catalyst is being launched as a three-stage educational program, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's all about systemize your business so someone else can actually do the work, right? So in other words, that will take you probably 12 to 24 months Yep. every system, every process has to be documented. And it's got to be documented in such a way that I could walk in and I could, um, as a mystery shopper, step into your shoes and do your work yep. following your process. Mm -hmm. right? Excuse me for a second. We have a couple of dogs in the podcast room this afternoon. Or you two. Okay. Okay. And then having systemized your business, you know, you need to fundamentally have someone come out who is not engaged in your business come in and see if they can actually understand them and follow some of your processes and fine tune them. Right. right. The second part of that strategy within uh, Cash Out Catalyst is replace yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. So the idea is that you, as the business owner, are so engrossed in your business that your staff become order takers. Yeah. Right. What we've got to do is we've got to change that philosophy and that will come through systemization so that someone else can pick up and do your tasks mm -hmm. and that you change your whole philosophy. So you do what I call work above the line. In other words, you as the investor should be looking for ROI on your business. You engage a manager and he works below the line and he's all about supervising the employees and getting the production through to satisfy you as the um, investor, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So the, the, there is a process there. So the objective of replacing yourself is that you can still work in the business, yep. but you're not the key key focus, that you can go and take three or six months off yep. and come back and find that the business is run fundamentally as good, if not better. <laughs> Most often better, I must admit, yeah. but yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, if it runs better, yep. systemization is working, yes. and you know you're ready for sale. Yeah. Fantastic. So right. what's the and third then, part? And then? the third part is what I call record. So it's all about, first of all, get your key metrics um, in terms of financial performance, mm -hmm. get them um, reviewed because it's you've got to get them in such a way that the buyer can see the results. Yeah. So you don't have them to suit yourself as management accounts. You have them buyer ready. So you take out all of the personal expenses of the business mm -hmm. and um sorry personal expenses it means you're going to pay more tax yeah. but at the end of the day it, it gives you a, a better um return on investment when you apply a multiple so you record those that can take three or four months yep you want to do it inside a financial year and then you want two or three years of improvement after that because you've got to show the investor what are the improvements that have been made so not only is it financial numbers, yep. but then becomes all the, but so should we say the non-financials, all the metrics about uh, your CRM system, how well is that performing? How, how's your, um, how is your uh, staff performing? What's your um, hit rate on your website or any other social platforms that you're on? Yep. And it's getting all of those metrics. So they're non-financials. And from there, um, and, and, and that, You've got to show systems improvement all the way through, mm -hmm. right? And it's no no good coming to us today to say, "Hey, I want to go to the market." If you come to us now and say you want to go to the market, you're a real estate transaction, yeah. right? So you've got to plan it, as Deborah said, three to five years in advance, and better still, start planning the day you the start your the business. business, yeah, because you don't know when you're going to, if you should be unfortunate to have an accident yep. how do you get out yeah right well it's more than that because like you said it's sort of for um, you want to have an asset that has some real value by the time you choose to retire retirement could be at 40 50 67 it doesn't matter yeah with um, with, with today's technology uh with and shall we say the computer geeks yep the technophobes they're bored within as soon as they've got a product launched and it's operating they're bored they want out mm -hmm. right and then they're on to the next venture so no it's not age restricted it's it's should we say maturity of the business when the business is ready 
Yep. Um, you should be ready. Fair enough. So what are the common pitfalls? What do you see in the businesses that you work with that mean that businesses just sort of plateau and don't, don't move beyond where they possibly could? Typically, they haven't had a um, chartered accountant or business advisor actively involved. Yep. Um, they, they consider it an overhead. Well, yep. my answer to that is if I'm just doing a tax return, I'm an overhead. But if I'm actually helping you grow your business, I'm an investment because I'm actually helping you grow uh, your turnover, your profitability, and the overall wealth and well-being of your, your uh, employees as well. Yeah. So to be fair, though, there are definitely accountants out there who are just about, you know, doing the, the legislative stuff, the stuff that needs to be done. Yep. Um, then there are people like yourself who actually add some value around that as well. And I actually call it management accounting. I remember when I used to work in big firms, you know, you'd have a, a number of different types of accountants. There'd be the accountants who were there for the legislative part of it and make sure it was done. And there were those who were producing the numbers that could actually help you make informed decisions. Yeah. So, so if, I, if I go into a business, one, I will look, in the, look at the numbers. Mm -hmm. But I want to understand the health and well-being of the business owner. Yeah. Where is their psyche? And, you know, a good walk around the, prem the premises will actually also tell you beyond what the numbers tell you. Mm -hmm. You know, is, is the place clean and tidy? Is it orderly? Could someone walk through it? Um, could someone do a stock take? You look at things like, as if we're talking inventory, yeah, you know, there's a dusty pile over there. So is that obsolete? Should it be in the business? Why not write it right off? off? Because yeah. one, there's an overhead carrying it. Two, there's an overhead in rent. Three, there's an overhead. In, and you could, in terms of, you could have used that money elsewhere. Hmm. Yeah, you, know, you might break even on it, but you, it's what I call the circular flow of cash. Yeah. You got rid of it. It tidies up your balance sheet and allows you to use that money again. Hmm. Okay, fair enough. So I, I go in as what I call, um, I offer a sounding board solution. So for my clients, um, yes, I am their chartered accountant, but they don't make informed financial decisions or even uh, HR decisions without saying, hey, Mary, what do you think of this? So yeah. I bring a different perspective to it mm -hmm. and say, have you thought of this? Have you thought of that? Yeah. And then allow them to make the decision. Hmm. Okay, so I want to be able to share some experiences with the listeners that they can actually, you know, look for those pitfalls and, and understand where they might be going wrong or what the little things they could be doing to improve what they're doing. Mm. Obviously, yes, there is, you know, not getting somebody involved like a child account or a business advisor kind of reasonably early on has a, has a massive impact. What else have you seen that they, because I, I, I know from my experience, not so much now because I'm dealing with much bigger clients, but at the ICE house when I was working with smaller clients, I had clients who never looked at their accounts. You know, they, they had a zero and they didn't even look on a weekly basis, yet alone anything more than that. So um, they just would wait till the end of the year until they got their, their accounts back and then they go, oh, it wasn't a great year or, oh, it was a good year. So when is I'm, that still common? <laughs> yes, it is. And, yeah. and when I, when I uh, take on new clients or well, before I take on clients, I want to understand their financial literacy. Mm -hmm. And the idea is if, if it's low, yep. part of my process of educating them is to do that. Yeah. Management accounts are something, but unless they understand what those numbers or how those numbers were generated, yep. it means nothing to them. Yeah, it's true. It's all it's it's what I call allowing them to make an informed decision with, with financial backing. Yep. Right. I used to call it loving your numbers. You know, yeah. I said, and you should love this stuff. I mean, I'm not an accountant. I don't particularly love numbers, but love I love looking at the numbers of the business because it gave you a really good indication of where things were going and not just the financial numbers, but like you said, the other metrics and things that we measure as well. So what I say to uh, clients and prospective clients is if you're reading your financial numbers, yep. you see the same clutter every day. I come in as an outsider um, and I'll, I'll pick numbers. I'll say, oh, there's a trend there that's wrong. Yeah. Why? And then we'll investigate and explore it. Mm -hmm. As I say, you're seeing your numbers day in and day out and you can't see the obvious. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Okay, what are the, what are the things do people well, do that uh, I, I found, hinder them? <laughs> yeah, I did a due diligence process where I was part of the selling process, right? Yep. And there it's all about communication mm -hmm. so we were owned by uh, a, a relatively wealthy person here in New Zealand um, he decided to put our business on the market for sale yep. he hadn't informed the managing director of my company right and he lost a lot of money as a result of it mm -hmm. now the reason he lost money 
was he didn't tell us he was going to put us on the market because we could have told him what was lying around yep. in terms of profit, <laughs> right? We, at that time, we had one and a half million tucked away in the balance sheet, which had he known that added to the value of how profitable the business was, he could have asked for a higher exit price. Yep. So it's all about communication. You don't have to be that public, but you know, at least inform your MD and your finance person yep. that, hey, this is what we're thinking of doing. So that was a costly mistake. Yeah. And I also find that, you know, sometimes by doing that as well, there are sometimes people who are in the business who might be the potential buyers. Totally. Yeah. You know, think about management buyouts, that happens quite a lot. Um, mm. So actually, first of all, good to get them on the same page. So they know what's going on, get them on your side, get them helping you. But potentially they might actually go, hey, we could be interested in actually taking this over. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, 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 if you're getting yourself into that um, scenario, it's all about, how healthy and how clean is your balance sheet in mm -hmm. your premises? Yeah. Right? As, as I gave you an indication, you know, stock, stock is a big one. Yes. Um, too often people buy stock and think they've got to hold six months worth of stock. Pre-COVID, yep. if your supplier was in your local jurisdiction, why are you holding six months stock? Why don't you change your philosophy mm -hmm. and get down to a just in time in other words yeah. you're holding say six weeks stock maximum not six months yes. that has a huge cash injection to the business if you can change your mindset yeah of course covid has relatively stuffed that, that one up though that, hasn't that, it, it yeah. certainly has. <laughs> so i've got a few clients who are you know big importers um and they have literally had to almost quadruple their kind of stock um importing at the moment just to make sure that they're actually able to supply and it's worked in their favor because it means that actually when people have wanted to buy others haven't had that stock holding and they were able to supply it but it has a huge 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 cash impact on the business i'll have to change my example going forward yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not at all because no, i know i mean it still it still makes perfect sense and i, I still think i mean it depends that's importing from overseas that's yeah. got a, a additional kind of consequences but yes mm. if the person's just down the road it's a local supplier um well you you, you take a um a technology company retail yep in a fashion Hmm. Why are they constantly got sales? Yes. You know, it's it's seasonal. So it's fashionable for three months or four months, and then it's a change of season. Yep. So if you can reduce your, your stock carry mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how long you, you're stocking it as opposed to when are you getting it just in time, yep. it has a huge impact. Yeah, that's true. Okay. So tell me a little bit about the Cash Out Catalyst. So where did that idea come from and what does it look like in terms of if somebody was interested in finding out more about it, what does it do? <laughs> so Cash Out, Cash Out Catalyst, uh, when we launch uh, mm -hmm. within the next month, um, which is likely to be the month of May, yep. is, is all, about, um, all about helping business owners be informed so that they as we say, don't let your lifetime's work retire with you. Mm -hmm. So it's it's taking them through that, that educational process. Some of it we would do and some of it we would outsource, especially things around systemization. Yep. But where it started was that, um, as I said earlier in the podcast, um, I was one of five boys. We, we had a farm. We had to move off it. Um, due to my father's loss of eyesight. Mm -hmm. And then over time, we decided we needed to sell it. Right? it and it's a case of how well was he informed about getting it ready for sale? Mm -hmm. Right? You can, you can talk stock capacities and, and anything like that. But financially, was the numbers ready? They weren't. Right? right? Yep. So it's, and I, I found or I consider that we left a lot of money on the table mm -hmm. that we could have got. Um, so I've always looked at that, and then then I've given you the example of um, one of my clients yep. who actually lost a lot of money mm -hmm. or left a lot of money on the table because he wasn't informed. So I thought, no, business owners need to be informed. Yeah. Too often they buy themselves a job, yep. and it's it's at the end of the day they close their doors. Mm. They don't consider the situation of maybe outsourcing a lot of the, the non-functional work that they do yep. as a paperwork mm -hmm. right that, that could quite easily be um, um apply or sent to a va to, to do yeah. and that you concentrate on your core activity i give an example rightly or wrongly should i other than for exercise 
should I mow my lawns, which will take me an hour and a half yep. and, that, and cost me 60 bucks, or should I be out there selling my services and maybe get um, three, four, five hundred dollars, yep. right? Yeah, I use the same example around cleaning as well. I mean, I actually, I actually say I'm, I'm half German, so I'm an excellent cleaner. You know, I really do an amazing job. But in reality, um, it's something I don't enjoy. I, I quite hate it. And it's a 25 hour, you know, what we call $25 an hour job. Whereas, yes, if I had those three or four hours to myself, I've got two options. First of all, I could probably generate several thousand dollars. Yeah. Or second, I could just have some time. And let's face it, time is one of the most important assets that we don't get it's, you know, it's a limited resource. Yeah. And so sometimes even just having that time free is worth it. Mm. Yeah. So I've, I've, if I give you an example, like I, I've got a client who's, we're going to use the name Paul. Yep. So Paul started his business six years ago. Mm -hmm. He works 70 hour, odd hours a week in the business. Right. He's, shall we say, a control person. Control freak. Yeah, we have a yes. few of those, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> so in other words, he's the order taker, he's the invoicer, he's the quota, yep. et cetera, right? Yes. He doesn't feel as though the business can do it any better than he can do it. So he hasn't got the, in his eyes, the support of his, his employees. Mm -hmm. He's at a stage where six or seven years into the business, he knows that within eight to 10 years, he's going to retire. Yep. He's tired. Mm -hmm. He's often caught having 40 winks at the desk. <laughs> yeah. Right. He's working six days a week. Yes. Right. So I had to go in there and explain a few uh, things to him about exit mm -hmm. and risk. And quite quickly, he saw that by engaging a new employee or a, one of his existing employees, to do the follow-up calls from his sales calls yep. that he started to get the get confirmation of sales orders. He was just too busy to do that stuff. To do to do any follow-up. So wow. there was no follow-up happening. Mm -hmm. Right. So he did that. We, we engaged a draftsman. Yep. Um, as opposed to having one outside, we put one inside and he did drafting and quoting. So now the, this client, Paul, yes. <laughs> has gained a day a week. That he can now either spend with his family yep. or work on the business. Yep. Right. So the, the next part of that process is he needs to start delegating, which he has done, mm -hmm. his financials. Right. Right. Yeah. And understand because in eight to 10 years, he's going to retire. And so the business is a major form of his investment. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure it's sale ready. Yeah. Right? Fair enough profitability because he's delegated to someone to do the sales follow-up profitability uh sorry turnover has increased by 40 percent wow and his gp is risen by a minimum of five mm -hmm. all in the space of 12 months yeah and right? it, by getting some help yeah it's all <laughs> about letting your employees take control instead of them being order takers they can make informed decisions themselves we call it delegate and elevate and it's basically yeah. around you know uh, making sure that you are elevated up to the things that you are really good at really great at and yeah. love yeah. and allow other people because there are people who actually enjoy doing that 25 dollar an hour work and, and are actually quite good at it whereas yeah. when you're doing it not only is it a waste of your um, financial resource in terms of what you might charge out but also you're in that real negative kind of space of oh i hate doing accounting i hate doing yeah. invoicing ah. yeah, well, yeah. In, in, in paul's case it's a case of you know he was doing too many functions because yeah. he, he didn't believe that the business could survive without him yeah so you've got to get him to a stage where he could take time off mm. and as we say if you if you can get to three to six months without actually having to pick up the phone yeah. that's that's when you've got it cracked yeah. yeah okay cool and that's that's the philosophy of a cash out catalyst. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So that's going to be online. And so the website address for cash out catalyst is www.cashoutcatalyst.com. Okay. That's pretty simple. We'll have a look at that. So, um, three top tips. Like, if you had to give something that the listeners can go away and do straight away, what would be the three top tips you would say? to business owners generally our listeners are established business owners so they might have somewhere between 10 250 staff um but they're yeah they're, they're, they're still looking to the future and what they can do okay employee external advisors whether they're accountants or lawyers or eos yeah <laughs> um consultants and 
and drill down you know go go away for a weekend and sit down and challenge everyone about where is the business going yeah okay you can't be the single voice of the business mm -hmm. it has to have a team environment because if you don't bring the team into it they're not going to buy your decisions yeah. going forward so it's, it's all about what EOS is about and it's really interesting we, I was just talking to an actual client of mine on a podcast a little while ago and she was saying that it was her husband and herself initially doing everything in the business and when they brought on the team members it meant that a the team was you know knew what was going on felt like they were part of that decision making but it also means they haven't got all that stress all on themselves and only themselves the fear, the fear there is the fear of letting go and letting um, employees yep. know some of your financial mm -hmm. information. Yep. They don't need to know everything. They just need to know what are the drivers that affect their side of the business. Yeah. They, all, I also find, and this is just a mass generalization, but in most businesses, they're scared of showing the numbers because they think employees will kind of go, oh, you know, that's I, how I much you earn. Yeah. Yeah. But in actual fact, most of the time, they actually think the owners make more money than the owners actually do. Totally. And when you start sharing those figures, it becomes a, oh, okay, I didn't realize that um, it wasn't as good as that. Because they just look at the top line figures and go, well, we're turning over $20 million. You know, we, we should be millionaires. When they look at the bottom line, it, it makes a, a bit of a reality check. Totally, I I support that. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Number two. What's it? Number two. Start early. Yep. So you said early on, um, really, the day that you open your doors is the day you should be thinking about what you're going to do when you close those. Yeah, doors. people yeah. might think that's a bit weird, but yep. hey, at the end of the day, there are basically three buyers out there, yep. right? Is it your family? Yes. Who typically don't want to be in the business, but they're they're looking at the goodwill of their father or mother mm -hmm. and, and taking the pass over. Yep. Um, is is it your your management yep. or are you going to the open market? Yeah. Yeah. No, nice. You gotta be you gotta be ready because if you're not ready, you're a real estate transaction. <laughs> and if you think about it, all of the best business books, Stephen Covey, yeah, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, it was all about start with the end in mind. Yep. So know where you're headed and then it'll become a whole lot easier getting yep. there. Okay, perfect. And number three. Uh, it's all part of the same, but I think it's, you know, start systemizing. Yep. And, and, and basically you want someone to come in as a, like, and I'll use the term mystery shopper. Yes. You want the mystery shopper to sit in your administration area and then your sales area and then in your production area yep. and tell you as an outsider where it's performing or not performing. Yeah. So you've got time to correct it because at the end of the day, what they see is what a buyer sees. Mm -hmm. You've always got to position yourself as not what you want to sell, it's what is the buyer wanting to buy. Yeah. So, and they're quite different. <laughs> true, very true. Okay, perfect. So if people want to get in contact with you personally, what's the best way to get hold of you, Murray? I have um, 0800 cash out. Okay, yeah. And uh, or pre-launch of uh, Cash Out Catalyst as a company, then um, murray at insightca.nz. Lovely. Ha happy to chat to anyone. Yeah. Because it's just sometimes it's just guidance. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Yeah and go from there it's the power of that external person i find it's often that we are so caught up in the you know the weeds and the day-to-day -day firefighting that we just can't lift ourselves out yeah. and and we're very fortunate as you know as people who come in from the outside we're like a coach right totally. we're actually able to watch what's going on on the playing field we are able to um, take our experiences from other businesses and ask we never tell i don't tell me what to do but i ask the questions totally. so that's interesting tell me a bit more about that or yeah yeah uh, and um, I was at a, at a recent networking meeting where the business broker said that 90% um, of businesses don't sell. Yeah. Right? Wow. And that is because there isn't anything to sell. There isn't anything to sell because the brand is the individual. Yeah. So never, never start a business using your personal name because mm. your personal name carries with you. It doesn't really carry with the new owner yeah it is i'm going to change that a little bit though i mean if you think about the big consulting firms pwc were three guys called price waterhouse and coopers weren't they mm, yeah so um, in the professional services it can work for a period of time but yes eventually but if it's a trade yeah it's got to be more than just the people yeah 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 completely agree hey look thank you so much that's been really thank you. informative it's fantastic yeah. to um, start talking about cash out catalyst yep look forward to seeing it launch um, i guess by the time this podcast comes out it might well be launched so yep cashoutcatalyst.com um, and that's murray phillips thank you very much for your time thank you very much thank you Thanks.